Ok, let's start. Euh, bienvenue pour ce nouvel intro. Good afternoon, everyone. So, thank you, Antiza, for presenting your research today. Uh, so, computer vision for deciphering and generating faces. So, your team, Antiza, uh, it's uh, the team, uh, the project team Stars, the, ta the, the team of uh, François Bremont, Spatio-Temporal Activity Recognition Systems. So, you have uh, 15 minutes for your presentation and after we'll have 15 minutes of, uh, for the question and discussion. So thanks Valérie and Damien for the organization. Thanks Fabien for the initiative and thank you. Merci Antitza for, for your presentation today. Thank you. Okay. So hello and welcome to my talk <coughs> on computer vision for deciphering and generating phase. So I'm Antitza Dantzeva and I'm at the Team Stars. Um, you will hear today briefly because the format is quite short. A few words about me. Then I'll introduce the topic, what's in a phase and why are we interested. And then we'll hear again a little bit about the two core topics, namely deciphering faces, which has to do with learning representations of human faces, and with generating faces. So learning predictive models of human face. And then again, very briefly, a few words on deep fake detection and some future directions. So, um, I have been with the STARS team since 2014, but in fact, I am Cherche de Recherche only very recently. My research is in computer vision and machine learning, and my background is in pattern recognition and telecom. So prior to INRIA, I have been with the Michigan State University and the West Virginia University. And my PhD is from Telecom Paris Tech. But in fact, um, I did the PhD with Eurocom next door. And my masters are from my home country, which is Austria, and specifically from the Vienna University of Technology. So about some, to give you some context, uh, what's in a face? So, human facial analysis has engaged multiple researchers from fields such as computer vision, biometrics, forensics, medicine, cognitive psychology, and so on. Why? Why are, have all they been interested in the human face? Well, because we are able to infer different degrees of personal information from a human face. For example, we are able to see the identity, we are able to see the health status, we can see expressions, or even to the uh, up to our mental state. And all of this solely based on a facial image. And what we need to, as computer scientists, take into account is the data randomness and uncertainty. So, I have covered a broad range of these topics, in fact. And for example, I have designed um, algorithms that are able to answer questions such as who is this person, um, how unique is the face of this person, what impedes the recognition of this person, for example, but also what are the attributes of this person. For example, this is uh, she is female, she's young, and she's Caucasian. And more recently, I have looked into you the not. emotions that um, a person is exhibiting. For example, is she smiling or not? And you might say, because I'm sure that you have heard about deep learning, artificial intelligence, and so on, well, given that we have enough input data, enough training data, and the current high capacity deep neural networks, we should be able to classify, for example, the identity, correct? Correct, <laughs> to a certain extent. So if we have like a constraint problem, for example, like face recognition with images which are relatively frontal, well-lit, and so on, and we have enough training data, then yes, our deep neural networks will perform fairly well. A little bit more challenging, but still okay is, for example, constraint expression recognition. So if we have kind of posed 
distinct expressions from frontal, well-lit individuals, then yes, we can classify this rather well. However, if we have a more real-world setting, like you see here in these videos below, where we have all sorts of covariates, for example, pose, illumination, expression, which conjointly come, the age of the subject is a different one than the one that we have in our training data, well then, it's becoming more challenging. So, we have seen this in our work on early apathy detection, where also very challenging is that the, the, the classes are very, very the differences are very subtle, so much that clinicians cannot tell based on the video the difference. So I have identified following challenges that I am working on in this context. So the one is to find a fine-grained representation that is able to help the classification of very uh, close categories, if you want, that can deal with limited training data because we work with um, hospitals in the region and we do have data but still it is only as many patients as they can provide us and also look, work with temporal analysis which is still a big challenge in the region. So and this motivates already the first part of the talk which has to do with deciphering faces and learning the presentation faces and specifically I will speak about a series of work that has to do with apathy and apathy classification. Why apathy? Well, apathy is a symptom of many neurocognitive, neurodegenerative, and psychiatric disorders. And what is exactly apathy? Well, it, once we start uh, to quantitatively reduce the activity in the behavioral, cognitive, emotional, and social dimensions. So how is this exhibited, for example, in reduced emotional response or lack of motivation or limited social interaction. So this series of work um, has been studied in collaboration with uh, some colleagues here from India, like I so happy, APG Das and François Plemont, but also clinicians from the University Hospital at Nice, Gadia Zigari and Philippe Aubert. So the objective has been, based on two relatively short of about one minute uh, duration videos, one of our positive narration and one of a negative narration, to be able to predict does this person have apathy or not. Um, okay, so we designed and developed a new framework that is based basically on emotion features and motion features. So the, the approach is based on back of visual words. We extract our features that we pull for a code book based representation. And for this work we did not consider for example the temporal relation. But in the latest work we, we consider that too. So we have the motion features where we simplified an um, expression recognition framework to classify positive, negative, and neutral emotions uh, because of the highly limited expression categories in real life. We also um, extract motion features. So these are, we detect basically the, the, the head and track it or facial landmarks and uh, track this to have some motion features. So, and based on emotion and motion features, we train regression models that are able to predict, for example, RMSC or NPI, so some clinical scores for apathy uh, indication. And so we run, of course, extensive uh, results and uh, extensive evaluation. And this framework, and specifically with uh, specifically selected features, were, was able to truly classify apathy to 
So these are some error cases, confusion matrices, and so on. And we proceeded to extend this work and to do it in more automated manner, if you want. So we took, again, similar features because they, sh they seem to have been successful, but we designed a um, multitask learning framework with which we, we um, process these features. And interestingly, though, with a lower accuracy, which, again, kind of makes sense because it's probably due to the limited data. So we can expect that once we have more data, this can increase. And most recently, we extended also this work to consider also the temporal uh, relations between the features with a gated um, recurrent unit framework. And we were able to go up to around 90% of true apathetic classification attempts. OK, so this was about the deciphering part. As I said, I have worked on many more topics, but I decided to zoom in on this specific uh, series of works. And now for generating faces, um, we have the following. So generative adversarial networks, GANs, you might have heard, have witnessed a lot of attention due to their capacity to model complex data distributions. And in doing so, they are able to generate realistic images or to translate images. Now, video generation is the natural subsequel of image generation. However, it showed to be much more complex. So in terms of complexity and computation, because now we have to not only generate the appearance, but we have to generate the appearance and the motion. And of course, interconnect them so that they make sense realistically. And once we started working on the topic, we found out that, uh, for example, retaining the identity throughout the generated video is challenging. Generating an uncertain motion is challenging because based on a noise vector or simply on an image to predict how the motion will continue is even for us humans not uh, uh, trivial. And also to model spatial temporal consistency is challenging. So not to have some jerky movement, but to have some realistically smooth um, motion. Um, in the series of contributions, most notably is are the last two ones. The one from last year, CVPR, for example, is purely on video generation. I will speak about it in the next slide. And the one from this year, CVPR, in fact, uses GAN generated data for data augmentation in the context of unsupervised person re identification and shows that uh, this is very helpful. So, the GTube GAN that we presented last year is um, a very interesting framework where we, in fact, aimed at disentangling appearance and motion. So and how did we do that? We proposed a three-stream architecture where the two auxiliary streams, so the temporal and the spatial, take either only the noise that is responsible for, uh, for appearance or only the, the, the noise responsible for, for, for um, the temporal um, exposition and feature maps. And they, the, the both provide feature maps at different levels to the main stream, the video stream that combines them both. Um, by doing that, by disentangling both, we are able to control better motion and appearance. Well, th this was the, the goal. And now looking at the full but simplified network is what we did is we stack several such G-Cube GANs. So G-Cube, because of the three-stream architecture, we stacked G-Cube modules. We included a uh, modified uh, spatial temporal self-attention to increase the video quality. And we built our GAN or our, yeah, our GAN network the following. So we have, of course, the generator, we have the discriminator, in this work, we focused on the generator um, with this proposed architecture and 
in the discriminator level, we have a video and then an image uh, discriminator. If we look a little bit closer into the G cube module, is what we see is that each stream takes the feature maps from the previous modules. We have three different types of feature maps, which go through the three different streams to upsample um, the feature maps. And then we have the spatial temporal fusion that combines feature maps from the three streams. And we run an extensive um, evaluation, again, on many data sets, comparing with many uh, state-of-the-art networks and outperforming the networks. And what was very exciting and interesting is that not we outperform them, but in fact, the competition is very, very strong. They come from NVIDIA or Snapchat, so they have far, far more resources than we do currently. And there are some videos that I think you cannot see in a very good resolution. And that's why, just, just to tell you, okay, everything looks realistic and looks nice. But what I will be sharing with you is the something more current is from a work that we are right now working on. And you can see, based on a driving video, how we are able to animate and generate realistic videos. Back my screen. And what we currently are looking into is also interpretability, um, bringing, opening up the black box of video games. Since we work on defect detection, we are also highly interested in detecting generated videos because we are very aware of the concerns that they bring to the fore. And in a relatively recent work is what we showed that um, 3D CNNs are able to, to, to detect deep fakes, but the detection accuracy decreases substantially once our networks has not seen in the training data mani manipulation techniques that we are testing on. So this is uh, kind of very concerning because the, the detection rates drop down at around 50%, which means that it's almost random given the binary classification. And future directions, yes. Uh, so deep fake detection should become more generalizable. We should look more into video GANs and the explainability thereof and the holy grail in classifications, self-supervised classification. So this work was done with my former postdocs, Apijit Das, I'm so happy with my genius PhD students, Yahui Wong and David Angilon, and with a master's student, Eta Van Boy, extending the deep so this concludes my talk and I'll be happy to answer questions.